We're now in public session. Good, af good afternoon. Uh, colleagues, once again, to remind you, if you have mobile phones, would you either switch them off or to flight mode? Uh, they interfere with the committee, both in terms of broadcast and recording and so forth. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statement you've submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting and members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Um, I'm pleased to welcome this afternoon the Housing Finance Agency, represented by Mr. Uh, Barry O'Leary and Mr. Sean Kremen. Uh, you've submitted uh, documentation and that has been circulated to members, so I'd now invite you uh, an opportunity to summarise that and I'll then ask colleagues uh, to they'd have a number of questions for you. Thanks very much, Chair. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. It's, thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you. Um, Sean and I will hopefully address some of your, your questions in the course of the thing, but I might just skip through some of the, the items in our, our submission. Just in terms of a bit of background, the HFA was established in 1982 to advance loan finance to local authorities and more recently to approved housing bodies. Uh, our role is to facilitate and support the delivery of social housing in Ireland. Uh, at the moment we have a statutory borrowing limit of 10 billion, outstanding loan book of 3.7 billion. Uh, and we raised the majority of our funding uh, from the NTMA and from local authorities uh, and also from the European Investment Bank and the Council of Europe Development Bank. So we have um, facilities still available of about 6.3 billion euro. Um, the majority of the HFA's loan book is provided to local authorities for mortgage and non-mortgage lending. From late 2011, the HFA began to lend to approved housing bodies, and at this stage we have uh, 15 approved housing bodies uh, through our certified body status, which means they can actually draw down funds from ourselves. Um, there's some information in our submission about the net lending to local authorities and the uh, loan approvals to approved housing bodies, and we can deal with those uh, as we go through the afternoon. But uh, last year, we did quite a bit of uh, approvals in the AHB area and we have uh, made approvals for the development of 650 houses last year, up significantly on the previous year. Um, the submission that we have for you this afternoon uh, really focuses on our area of finance. There are obviously a number of areas uh, in the general housing uh, scene to do with planning, regulation, the development cost structures, procurement, the availability of land, and obviously the, the committee will focus on that themselves, but our proposal surrounds um, the provision of finance. Um, and what we're suggesting is that, having looked at and dealt with the AHBs in the last number of years, um, and we would be in constant contact with them in, in terms of their development plans, we believe that of the 15 that we're doing business with at the moment, they have the ability to produce over the course of the next four or five years about 4,500, maybe 5,000 houses uh, for people. They're doing very good work. They're significantly improved uh, the delivery that they uh, achieved last year. But even if that estimate is out by a range of 1,000 or 1,500, the likelihood is that there'll be relatively, uh, relatively uh, few houses delivered more than 5,000. So we feel, in terms of complementing the strategy that the Department of Housing have at the moment, which is focusing on the, the provision of 35,000 units, that uh, we need to look at lending money to local authorities again for them to build uh, social housing. Um, our submission is that to get the scale involved, local authorities need to be involved, and they, they could 
within that period produce probably twice the number of houses. We've put into our submission that that would be 9,000 homes. Um, the breakdown of the, inf of the funding uh, requirement is in our submission, um, where we show that there would be gross lending involved of about 2 billion. The normal life of our existing loan book is such that there's repayments coming back in from mortgages, uh, and in a normal way, our, our book is, is falling. And you'll see within the submission that the red figures there show uh, the, the normal repayments of annuities. So we're saying that that capacity plus some additional new borrowing should allow for a gross lending of two, th uh, two billion split then between local authority lending and AHB lending, there'd be a net lending situation of 1.3 billion, and that that would uh, allow the building of 13,500 units, which would be roughly 40% of the, to the total requirement under the, the government strategy, the 35,000 that we spoke about earlier. So why did we come to that why do we come to that conclusion? First of all, we think that, that what's required at the moment are that houses, homes need to be built for people. Uh, we think that the capacity of the local authorities is such that they're best placed to do that building. And we think that historically, the cost of finance is, is so low at the moment that it just produ uh, produces a unique opportunity. Um, we're in the position to borrow money and the European Investment Bank are quite keen to give us money. They'll give us fixed rate money for 25 years at something below 2%. Uh, we can pass it on to local authorities cheaply. There's very few of us in the HFA. We don't need a whole lot of overheads. We can pass that on at a very tight margin and enable the houses to be built. So the cost of funding is such that it's not going to be this low forever. Something's going to happen in the next year, two years, three years. Rates will start drifting away. The servicing cost, if you were to borrow a billion euro at the moment, is such that, that you could service it on an interest-only basis for about 17.5 million. You could pay principal and interest and cover the servicing of it for about 50 million a year. And you'll see reports all the time that, that the cost of emergency accommodation is such that we're probably spending that kind of money already on, on uh, an emergency accommodation. So we just think it's an opportunity that should be looked at. Now, it's very easy to say that. It, it would be silly to say it and not acknowledge that there are certain constraints on the government in terms of borrowing constraints. Uh, our contention is there's just got to be a decision made to do this and build the houses. That, that the opportunity is such, and temporary as it is, it's just got somebody's got to make a decision to do that borrowing, facilitate it, and get the homes built. At some point in the future, you can look at the local authorities either selling them or maybe giving mortgages to people who, if they can be shown that they can service the thing without putting risk onto the books of the local authorities, or you can transfer them to approved housing bodies. But the, the primary objective is to get the houses built. People need homes. The money can be there. It's relatively cheap. And that's the, the essence of the, the proposal. Um, we believe that our proposal targets the finance side of things. It allows those who can respond quickest to achieve the necessary scale of development. We think the current interest rate environment is such that we should do it, and uh, that, in essence, is the, is the proposal we bring to you today. Thank you very much, Mr O'Leary. Just, just before I open it up to questions, one or two quick, quick comments. You indicated that the cost of borrowing to the HFE, uh, HFA would be something under 2%. Is that correct? Yes. I suppose the first question I'd ask is, as you advance that to local authorities, what, what rate would you, would you see that being charged at? Well, um, you, I'll give you just a couple sure. of quick points. Secondly, um, You've set out a, a programme here which is ambitious in terms of, uh, and Deputy Durkin will be very pleased to see local authorities back in, in housing, but apart from the, the finances, have you had any feedback from local authorities in terms of their capacity to deliver these units? And I, I notice this is a, is a financial document and I'm not in any way critical, but have you done it in tandem with the capacity of the local authorities? There's no point you putting the funding in place and, and no drawdown. And the final thing you mention is that obviously there are other repercussions from the state's finances. And by that I presume you mean this is uh, an unbalanced sheet uh, expense. And you might comment on those and then I'll go to Deputy Durkin. Okay. Um, 
Firstly, in, in, in the, the area of rates, as it stands at the moment, if somebody came to us for money, we would be looking at lending at 1.75 fixed for 25 years. So it takes the shock out, the variable interest rates are not there, 175 fixed. So you're watching the We'd advance it to the local authorities, okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of local authorities' capacity to, um, to build and to lend, we have had conversations with them. We've been in contact with local authority heads of finance and the CCMA, and they're interested. They would love to be able to borrow. There are issues for them in the sense that they want to be sure that if they borrow, that they're not going to be put in a position where at some point in the future they're struggling um, with the capacity to repay it. Uh, they like the idea that it's fixed and there's certainty about it, but there, there are certainly issues for them in terms of interacting with the department and making sure that there's something like something of the style of the payment and availability agreement that's available for approved housing bodies is made available to them so they have certainty that their own financial situation is, is kept stable. And uh, all of our borrowing, I didn't, I didn't say it in the thing, I skipped over a paragraph or two, but all our borrowings are on balance sheet. So it is one of the challenges. Uh, our contention is there, there are lots of potential solutions that will contribute to this. There's off balance sheet vehicles, there's public-private partnerships, there's maybe activity that, that can be done with credit unions. They're all things that are taking time. An intervention where the local authorities get involved, a signal being given to them to go ahead and build, is, we feel would be done quicker than all the other options. And it doesn't preclude them being transferred later into some other thing to get them off balance sheet. But we think the, the primary uh, consideration is to get the houses built at this stage. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Deputy Durkin. Thank you, I'm delighted to welcome uh, a re-emergence of the local authority house building programme uh, as being a major contributor to alleviating the kind of problems we have. And incidentally, uh, I'm delighted to, to see the House of Finance Agency here. I was instrumental in, in helping to uh, facilitate the, one of the first, very first housing finance agency loans that was ever approved in this country. And the person is still living in that house to this day, all those years ago. So that proved the point that the person who started off there was quite happy to buy a house for a lifetime and has remained there. <clears throat> the, the questions are as follows. Uh, first of all, I, I, I noticed that uh, body, the approved housing body, are emerging again. And we had, as you know, Chairman, the credit unions here a few weeks ago, and they were willing to lend to uh, the approved housing bodies which to my mind would be defeating the whole purpose of the exercise again because we, we, they would be then getting involved in the property business in the same way that the lending institutions got involved in the property business before the boom and we got onto the treadmill again. Can I ask, to what extent uh, can you facilitate the local authorities by way of local authority loans, the local authority loans fund, which used to be a fundamental part of the way the local authorities met the housing needs of people who are on the housing list. Uh, can you do it now? Is it possible to, to, to provide funding directly or indirectly as opposed to just going to, to the voluntary housing bodies? Can I ask as well uh, whether or not you agree that there's far too high a dependency on, on private rental property at the moment? And we've had the various interest bodies in here over the past few days. And do you accept that there's, that there's too high a dependency on, on that market? Because reference has just been made to the fact that there's not much sense in inviting the private rental sector into the business and beating them up when they're in there. So there's, they're in, they're in lies, 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 there's a question. Uh, lending to the local authorities, you borrow at the rate of 0.8%, I presume, from the, the, the um, uh, European Investment Bank or whatever, or thereabouts. I know the government can borrow at that anyway. And uh, at what extent you're, you're going to lend at lower than 2%. So you're taking, they're taking a 1.5% or 1.25% or 1.5%. One, one, one Somebody's taking 1% out of it in the, in, in the course of the handling fee, I presume. Or, or whatever it is. I'd like some clarification of that. And I would also like to know whether or not um, the, the, the structures that, that uh, on and off balance sheet, we've had a lot of discussion this year, and I think it's fundamental to what we're at. Um, can you see a facility whereby, by way of cooperatives or by way of, of uh, public-private partnerships, you directly or in conjunction with the local authorities, and, and I'm sidestepping the voluntary approved housing bodies, 
particularly and specifically sidestepping them. To what extent can you assist the local authorities in their particular programme? And recognising that the com combination of what you have spoken about would bring up something in the region of 13,000, 13,500 houses in, in the marketplace. I believe that the requirement is somewhat higher than that. I believe it's nearer to 16,000. And I have held that view for quite a long time. And I put forward various proposals, as everybody else has here around the table as well, to various ministers, environment, uh, public expenditure, finance, everybody. So there, there, there's a problem there that if we have 100,000 families on the local authority housing list at the present time, give or take 20 or 30,000, depending on who you're talking with, it would take five years at best to, to overhaul it entirely. And that's presuming that there will be no growth in, in the number on waiting lists in the meantime. So there's a necessity to, to, to make a more serious impact. And the last point, I think, I want to congratulate you on appearing before the committee, coming before the committee. But it is hugely important the way you proceed from here on in. The Housing Finance Agency are going to determine in a large way the manner in which we deal with the housing crisis that now exists. If you, if you are not in a position to make a major contribution, and I suspect that you are and can, but if you're not in a position to do that, then the whole issue will, will, will implode again and we'll be back in a year's time, we'll be talking about the same, same thing, and if we're depending on the private rental sector, we'll be back in five years' time and two, two years' time, we'll be talking about the same thing. We're talking about the reliance on the approved housing bodies, I want to finish with this, uh, who, who are excellent for the special needs, the sheltered housing and the niche market in the area, are much better than the local authorities but not capable of dealing with the main thrust and the weight of the, the whole requirement that is the public housing programme, and how will you respond to that? Thank you, Deputy Durkin. Sorry about that, you're, you're welcome. Uh, Mr O'Leary, I'll take a couple of questions and you can deal with them t together, if that's okay with you. Deputy O'Dowd. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here, and I think it's great to have a body that has the capacity to borrow at the very low rate that you can and it's hugely beneficial obviously to the state um, I, I just to, to expand a little bit what Bernard is saying there it seems to me from what you're saying is that you have the money uh, you can get the money it's, to, it's a question of then passing it on to the agencies that can spend it and you do obviously do, do due diligence on them either by local authority or, or association. So the question is, you know, what's missing, uh, what's missing in the equation to, to fast track what you're doing? Obviously, you can get the money. It's a government objective, I think, it's in the public for government to actually specifically it talks about going to the EU to, to borrow, I presume, an increased amount. I mean, that's not a matter, obviously, for, for you today. But the question is, can we, can we spend it? You know, why aren't we spending it? Uh, you know, what, what's, what's the barrier that you see? And one question I have, um, can you use it for, obviously, you must get the money back. So <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> one of the big issues is the deficit in infrastructure. Now, could it be used for infrastructure deficit? In other words, could it be used, uh, there's 100 million in the government, uh, program for government, for infrastructure deficits. Uh, you know, how can you use it? Could you, are you, would it make sense? It may make no sense at all, but, where you have state-owned land uh, that doesn't have infrastructure like sewage and water and so on, would it be a plan, theoretically, that you take somewhere like Gormanstown, which is, you know, say 200 acres of state land there, so if you took 60 acres, put in the services and, you know, how do you, how do, um, with, with a local authority, obviously a partner, an approved housing body, in other words, how can we fast track what you want to do, or is that already happening? Thank you. Deputy and thanks for the presentation. Just um, to start off with, I just want to agree with the comments of the chairperson of the HFA, HFA today, Dr. Michelle Norris, in the Irish Times, where she was quoted as saying that we should seek permission from the EU to extend government borrowing to finance social housing. Um, I've asked Minister Noonan already in this committee, would he push for greater flexibility at the European level on on EU fiscal rules to support long-term investment programmes, with social housing being a top priority in that regard. Minister Newman, Noonan informed me that he had already, and I want to quote him, pushed very hard, and that, and quote him again, we do not meet the criteria for applying, particularly in light of economic cycle and other factors. And just my question then is, are you aware of the government having pushed hard for this and the assertion that we do not meet the criteria? If not, can you outline whether you believe we would meet the criteria and what exactly is the criteria? Thank 
you. Thank you. Mr O'Leary, a number of questions there, or Mr Kremen, whoever wants to sure. deal with them. Okay, uh, we'll try and go back to the beginning. Um, First of all, the HFA's proposal is just a suggestion. We're not necessarily back in the. This hasn't. This hasn't been approved by the Department of Finance as yet. Um, in terms of local authorities, we lend to local authorities if they have two things: they need a council resolution and they need a DOE sanction. Or I use the word DOE, but the Department of Housing that they are now. So, once they have those two elements, they will get funding with, uh, from us within a week. There is no further due diligence required on the assumption that the state is not going to let local authorities go bust. And our situation is that we have no arrears with local authorities. We never had in our 30-year existence. So we don't waste, in vertical commas, time doing due diligence. We give them the money. They pay us back. We're very keen to get it back, as Deputy O'Dell suggested. But that's how it works. We, we lend it. Uh, we do do a due diligence with uh, AHBs, and we have 15 AHBs approved, and I think in our submission we gave a list of the AHBs. Um, in terms of lending and the lending rate to the local authorities, uh, our margin typically would be the order of 25 basis points, a quarter of 1 per cent. So the, the rate that we're getting money from the EIB, and our, our indicative rate in our, in our proposal is at 175. If we can do it lower, lower we will do so, but we, we figured we need to put a rate on it uh, in the proposal. So we picked 175 as the potential. Uh, we're not certainly getting money from the EIB at the rate that you suggested. The state may well get it at that, but we're getting it a little bit more expensive than that. If we can get more money from the Council of Europe Development Bank and blend it in such a way that we have no interest rate risk exposure, we would be delighted to lend it at anything less than 175, but we just put 175 in as a number to be working with. Um, I do not know that we have any particular comment to make in terms of uh, over-dependency on the private rental sector. Um, the, in terms of dealing with AHBs, the, the 13 and a half thousand we can cert, or the local authorities rather, we could do more than 13 and a half thousand. That number ties in with the, the social housing strategy that the Department of Housing have. Uh, if it was decided that that more needed to be done, that could be done. There's no no particular difficulty of that. AHBs certainly have a big part to play in the delivery of those 35,000 in areas, not just so. The reality is they are doing all sorts of general housing as well. That's that's just the reality of what's happening. Our suggestion is that local authorities need now to, con uh, to contribute more and be asked to, to borrow for that. Uh, in terms of money being available, Deputy Dowd, the money is certainly there. Um, the EIB in particular have indicated to us that we could get more money off them at any point in the future. The barrier to spending it is really the, the, the financial constraints within the budgetary environment. So the decision on this is is in that domain rather than our domain. Where so it was off, no, off balance sheet is a different issue. Yeah. But if they agree to put it off balance sheet or if you could find a vehicle to do it, say NAMA could theoretically could NAMA look for it and you guarantee it to them or be their guarantor? Is there some way is there a way around that or is theoretically there should be? I mean it'll make a huge difference. There's been a lot of work done in the last two years by the departments um, social housing strategy group looking at new funding models. The reality is that we've seen other state entities struggle to get off balance sheet in the last two years. It's, it's, a, it's a very difficult task. Yeah. Europe is making it more difficult by the month for things to get off balance sheet. That's just the reality. And what we're saying is, by all means, pursue that in the future. If you're successful with it, terrific. But in the meantime, build the houses. And if you want to sell the houses from local authorities, and some people might not like that, but if you want to sell the houses at, at some point or transfer them into some other vehicle, terrific. But they're built at that stage. The local authority loans, uh, German, that used to be. The local authority Now loans, just a memory. The local loans yeah, fund. That, that, that evolved into the HFA. That ceased in sort of late 70s, early 80s. I know. And then the HFA started. But yeah. the HFA gave mortgages. About a third of our book as it stands is in mortgages, where we lend to the local authority and they pass it on. And we have the capacity even now um, to lend mortgages to local authorities who could unlend it to people. And we were discussing last week with the heads of finance and local authorities the attractiveness or otherwise of a 25-year fixed rate 
loan. So if, if local authorities were able to give that out to creditworthy people within the local thing, what would that do? Now, they do have a book which is significantly in arrears, and you'd, you know, you'd like them to be conscious of the risk involved in, in, in that sort of a proposal. But the reality is, if you give a fixed rate loan out at about, say, 2% or 2.25% to the consumer, that gives a level of affordability that means that actually owning a house and being in a, in a mortgage paying situation is possibly more affordable than a, than a rental situation. So there are a number of possibilities in that area. That would be good. Deputy Quinlevin's uh, question. Uh, so there, was a, there was a question, and forgive me, I forget who, ans who asked the question in relation to infrastructure and the, re the, the answer is that we can actually we can lend for housing and housing related purposes. So if the infrastructure is being done in order to facilitate house creation, we can certainly do that and would be at rates similar to that. Um, in terms of your question, Deputy, uh, I wouldn't be party to any of the discussions where people in, in finance have, have been involved with uh, representations to Europe. Um, so I can't help you, I'm afraid, on that front. Just for who, uh, at this morning's session, um, we are having officials from the Department of Finance before we conclude, and there may be, it might be worth following some of those lines of questions at that stage. Uh, Deputy Wallace. Uh, thanks for your look. Uh, well, my question was actually around the same uh, issue. Uh, I mean, you're saying that the Europeans are putting up barriers by the month to uh, prevent uh, off balance sheet borrowing, uh, but yet uh, we see that Spain, France, Italy, Lithuania, and Austria are all going to break that rule this year, and uh, it doesn't look like they're going to su uh, suffer any penalties. Um, France uh, has actually, it looks like Europe are going to give them permission to uh, borrow off balance sheet uh, without any of the penalties involved to deal with uh, f extra spend on security because of ISIS. And, uh, I, I suppose, obviously, you answered the question there, but I was wondering how, in God's name, Ireland can't be given some sort of flexibility uh, in lieu of the fact that we have an emergency around housing, uh, which uh, surely uh, has greater merit than what France is up to, uh, and uh, given that they're spending probably more money bombing the living daylights over I can Syria still. Uh, my question would have been to you, uh, which is just as it was, if you had any part in the negotiations with the Department of Finance around this area. Uh, sometimes we wonder, do the Department of Finance even ask, can we have the money off balance sheet without incurring uh, penalties? Or uh, do we take the decision uh, that we don't ask anywhere because we're such good boys, we don't want to challenge the rules? Uh, I don't, uh, I'm just wondering if you have any input in that area. Uh, I'll, take, I'll take one or two others. Deputy Coppinger. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a pity this is now rather than with the finance session that we're having because I think it will be more appropriate to that. But um, I, I also want to ask about the EU rules. Um, and I think this is a critical issue for the housing situation in this country. Um, just to clarify, are the EU rules are preventing you from lending to local authorities. Is that the case? And is that the only reason? Um, can you clarify, for example, if the state was to spend more on social housing, if it raised more tax to fund that social housing, is that in keeping with the EU rules? For example, if they decided, like wealth of the top 250 people rose in this country by 3% last year, so if you decided to bring in a 3% wealth tax, for example, and use that to fund housing, um, corporation tax, for example. You know, if the state, if the Irish government took the decision to raise taxes, can my understanding of the EU rules isn't that it prevents spending. It's that the spending has to be, uh, the income has to be found to justify that spending. So, um, for example, the net profits of the top thousand companies in Ireland went up by 25% in the last year. So, a corporation tax increase or something could be considered for the homeless emergency. Um, I'd be interested to hear your views on that because this is going to be critical. Because uh, I, I met the housing minister and he told us, no, NAMA can't be directed to build social and affordable housing 
because it's a special purpose vehicle and it would then not be on, it would be on balance sheet. So this whole issue of on and off balance sheet, um, it just seems to me off balance sheet is becoming increasingly impossible to achieve. Um, even Irish Water, even PPPs are being recategorised as being on balance sheet. I mean, for years the department's been looking for ways to be off balance sheet, and it can't be. So if this is a, a straitjacket that, pe that the EU has imposed, w we need to be able to tell the general population that. Um, and lastly, in the past, Dublin County Council raised bonds to fund social housing. Um, this was said apparently this morning by Michelle Norris at the housing agency meeting. Um, but it was self-financing through rents, because in the past, this kind of came up as a topic before, in local authority housing estates you had a diversity of people. You had low income and middle income workers. You didn't just have low incomes. So it was more possible for Dublin City Council at that time to be self-funding and getting higher rents back in. So is it plausible that if, for example, you raised the uh, qualification, you know, the income threshold for social and affordable housing, whatever guys we chose it to be, I think there's a need for both, uh, that we could actually do something like that again, rather than keeping the income limits very low for social housing and then thus the rents being very low that accrue to the housing agency or the local authority. And just very last thing, I want to clarify something I said at a previous meeting. Um, there was a housing agency. I said uh, NAPCO who hadn't repaired windows. I understand that they have repaired those windows since and I'd like to clarify that. I'm very happy that they have. I wouldn't like to give them a bad name. But there is a problem with you just funding housing agencies because we don't, I don't think many people believe they have the scope and ability to provide social and affordable housing on the scale that's needed. I think it has to be local authorities. Mr O'Leary, do you want to address those couple of issues first and then I'll take the remaining okay. deputies? I'll certainly try. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't advance the HFA as being experts in the EU rules and they are extremely difficult to understand and they're changing all the time but my understanding of the situation is that the existing budgetary constraints in terms of deficit and in terms of the expenditure that is there is, is preventing local authorities being allowed to borrow. Um, whether they're classified as the EU <coughs> rules or whether there's decisions within the existing fiscal space, I honestly am not in a position to tell you. But there's obviously there is a distinction between choices made within that fiscal space and the EU rules. And I think there's people in the Department of Finance who, who know an awful lot more about them. I think you'd be safer talking to them about it. Um, the barrier from our point of view is that the Department of Housing would get an allocation as to what local authorities are allowed to borrow in the course of the year. And at the moment, that's very tight. And if they can finance that borrowing within their own uh, and service it within their own resources at the moment, they're allowed to do it. And obviously, very few of them can actually achieve that. So we're saying that within within the current and budgetary uh, environment, some choices will have to be made, some priorities will have to be decided upon. And one of the things that we think ought to be a priority in this area is allowing them borrow up to. A net, I think in our in our uh, presentation, it's a net 620 million, but a gross 1.3 billion. So that would allow them to do the 9,000. But the the actual fine print of what is EU rules and, and whether they've asked the question, or not, we just we don't have the the wherewithal to comment on that. Um, certainly, you would imagine if if all our taxes were introduced, that would create additional space. That's really in our area, our area. We're an organisation with 12 people in it, and we're reasonably good at borrowing money cheaply and lending it cheaply and getting it paid back and rolling it over again. And that's, you know, that's what we're bringing to the table with this proposal. Uh, in terms of the Dublin bonds, they certainly worked in the past, and I don't think there's anything really to stop them working in the future. In the sense that there is an affordability model being worked on in, in the department at the moment, where there would be a certain amount of mix. And we would be quite happy to lend money in that direction. Um, there's obviously a balance to be found because we're using, uh, we have the benefit of a, a government guarantee. Um, 
and no state aid questions arise because of the fact that we're providing a social housing need. But as you get more and more private uh, rental or affordable renting into that mix, you need to be just cognizant of whether there's any state aid issues arise in that. But I think you could do a fair bit of activity before that would become a problem, given that the nature of the, the social housing uh, requirement at the moment is about 35,000 houses. You'd have a lot of affordable done before that would raise its head. But in principle, I think we'd have no issue about lending into that environment and facilitating that, because it is, after all, facilitating housing, which is what we're here to do. Um, did I miss out on anything on that? I don't think so. I think that's it. Um, and as I say to colleagues, we do have officials from the Department of Finance specifically on that point that you requested, so we, we will continue that discussion. Deputy Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just a, uh, a quick one, a slight deviation from your core submission. Um, in the past, certainly in my part of the world, North County Dublin, there were very successful small local cooperatives uh, building maybe 25, 20, 25 houses uh, quite successfully for local groups. Is that something you could facilitate in terms of lending to either directly or indirectly? Um, the main business we do with AHBs, you have to qualify and you go through a three-tiered assessment of their corporate structure, their past history and their future plans. Quite rigorous, 15 really decent-sized AHBs have qualified for that. We then have a secondary product that we call a tier two product where Anybody who's registered as an approved housing body and has signed up to the financial chapter that the housing regulator has brought into place can borrow up to one and a half million from us on a much more reduced assessment basis. So if they give us a set of accounts that proves that they're solvent, we would look at giving them up to one and a half million. But that would be the extent of our, our offering. And that was targeted to be just spread the risk across the sector because there's quite a number of players in the sector. Um, all of the people, the AHBs that come to us, ha uh, have to have a payment and availability agreement in place and that's a, an arrangement with the local authority so that the local authority then have nomination rights where they, they actually nominate people from their housing list to go into the houses. So if all of that's in place and you have a solvent set of accounts, within a period of about two weeks, you'd get one and a half million from ourselves towards, you now whether you'd get 25 units done for that, I doubt, but you know, it would, it's certainly there on a small scale to, to encourage activity. I'll take the remaining two, I think it's only two. Deputy Butler. Thanks, Cahir, look. Um I think you're after bringing a little bit of um, sunshine in with you today, because we're after having so many bleak sessions and tearing our hair out, thinking where are we going to move forward with this housing and homelessness crisis. We, we, we've, had a, we've had a lot to, to get through over the last month. Um, I suppose it, it's, it's very welcoming to hear that you actually have funds and that you can fast track them, that you've just said there, you know, that you can, you can get them fast tracked within, within a couple of weeks. Do you accept that um, the local authorities going forward to kind of phrase have a huge part to play in this? And secondly, could I ask, and you may not have the answer to this now, and that's, that's, there's no problem, you can forward it to us. How many of the local authorities applied for finance from you in the last five years? How many were successful and how many were unsuccessful? Or was it just government policy that local authorities did not build? Because we've had the local authorities in here, the... Um, the local authorities came into us one of the earlier sessions and they said first going down um, they don't have the finance and second going down they said even if they were allowed to build whatever they wanted to that they, are, they can only supply between 10 and 15 percent of, 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 of I'm sure that's what they said of, of what's needed and they also said they also pointed out the fact that their local authorities they're not builders so you're giving us a ray of hope here but at the same time there seems to be obstacles wherever we turn so if just your thoughts on that please finally i'll take the final one um, De deputy o'sullivan yeah, and, and my question follows directly from that because i just noticed on your conclusion you know and you, you said that you're committed to fi financing the local authorities and approved housing bodies and to target it at those who can respond quickest and i was asking um what engagement you have at the moment with lo local authorities are any of them ready to avail of this funding and to actually move on building thank you mr o'leary um, to deal with the applications from local authorities, I, 
not surprisingly, I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but, but it's, it's easy enough to, to send those on to you. Um, those who've been, anyone who applied from a local authority world got money. We have never refused a loan to a local authority. And I should just say, in terms of lending to AHBs, if you've qualified, and there's a fair level of a hurdle to qualify to get money off us, but once you've qualified, we have a 100% record of applications being approved thereafter. We've never actually refused an application. What we do frequently do is not qualify people because we might have concerns about their existing track record or, or their corporate governance or their future plans, and we'd work with them to improve that. But once you've qualified, and you have this famous payment and availability agreement in place, that's fine, and we, and we have a 100% record. So I can answer that part of it straight away. That's, that's straightforward. Um, our interaction to date with AHBs, our proposal is really part of a strategy that we're producing ourselves for our own organisation. Uh, and naturally enough, we've had interaction with all our stakeholders, the Department of Finance, Public Expenditure and Reform, the Department of Housing, but within the last fortnight we've been talking to the CCMA's Housing Committee, so the County Manager's Housing Committee have been spoken to, uh, and last Thursday we were speaking to uh, the Heads of Finance and Local Authorities. And they're interested, but it's not a panacea, like we're not coming in today, fine, I'm delighted to hear there's a little bit of sunshine in it, but like we're not saying this is the solution to all ills. And like what we have is a reasonably well thought out proposal, but somebody needs to take that on a step and make probably a political decision to say, yes, that's the route we're going to go. This isn't just turn up and it's all solved by any stretch of the imagination. There are still barriers for local authorities. And I think in the introduction I, I alluded to some of them, there are issues around planning and procurement and land that need to be looked at. So it isn't just the HFA turn up with money and it's all solved, but the finance side of it is the only part that we're representing that we know something about. So that's why we're focusing on that. But there are, I know there's work going on in terms of what can be done in the planning area, what needs to be done in procurement, and what needs to be done on land. Local authorities are interested in doing this. They're not builders, that's absolutely true, but they're certainly in a position to go out to tender and procure builders. And I think what's required at this stage is a signal to them that if they were to do that, that they will be supported financially. And part of their situation then is they must, they must be certain that if they commission this work, that they'll have something in place that there's a guaranteed stream coming from central government that will allow them pay that back because you know we still want our money back when we do lend it. That, that uh, concludes uh, the session this afternoon. Thank you very much for the presentation and your answer to the questions. And I suppose it's quite obvious it's a complex area. And while you've delivered one side of the equation, uh, the on and off balance sheet debate is an issue that we as a committee will be continuing with the uh, Department of Finance. Uh, that concludes uh, today's business. Um, I'd like to thank Mr O'Leary, Mr uh, Kremen from the Housing Finance, uh, Finance Agency and to members, we'll now adjourn until Thursday at 10.30am. Thank you.